Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are so happy to that you've all joined us tonight. Thank you so much for logging into this um, virtual event um, and celebrating National Midwifery Week. Um, we're I'm really excited to uh, be able to host our session tonight. So let me start off by introducing myself. I am Eileen Thrower. And I am the chair of the Department of Midwifery and Women's Health at Frontier Nursing University. So I'm really excited to um, have the honor to introduce our speakers this evening. Um, we have Dr. Stacy Olson and Dr. Tanya Tanner joining us for a presentation entitled Evidence-Based Pharmacological Treatment of Peripartum Mental Health Disorders. So um, I'm going to Get us started off by first introducing Dr. Stacy Olson. She is a um, course coordinator with us here at Frontier Nursing University. She's been with us since 2019. Um, before coming to Frontier, she was a program director for the Psych Mental Health Nurse Practitioner Program at the University of North Dakota, where she also taught undergraduate and graduate nursing programs. She earned her DNP in nursing from Duquesne University in 2012, a Master of Science in 2010, and a Bachelor of Nursing in 1995, both from the University of North Dakota. She is a fellow in the American in the AACN in the Leadership for Academic Nursing Program. Um, Dr. Olson has practiced as a psych psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner for over 12 years, providing services to rural and underserved populations in private practice. She provides mental health walk-in services and substance use treatment. She is the mother of a 23-year-old daughter and two fur babies. She enjoys reading, kayaking, traveling, and spending time with her family. Dr. Olson is a passionate believer in lifelong learning and helping others. Along with Dr. Olson tonight, we have Dr. Tanya Tanner joining us for this presentation. She joined Frontier Nursing University in 2011. Um, she's taught in our midwifery and WHMP programs and now um, is the course coordinator for our Psychiatric Concepts for APRNs, which is a course that all of our midwifery, FNP, and WHMP students take um, as part of their um, core curriculum. She earned her PhD in nursing from the University of Colorado in 2012, a master's in business administration from the University of Phoenix in, in 2000, a master's in nursing from the University of Utah in 1996, and a bachelor's in nursing um, from Westminster College in 1994. She belongs to multiple honor societies and has received multiple awards, including the prestigious Colorado State Nightingale Award. She's also the past president of the Colorado chapter of the American Psychi Psychiatric Nurses Association. After practicing full scope nurse midwifery and serving primarily underserved women, Dr. Tanner obtained her postgraduate certificate as a psych mental health nurse practitioner and currently practices at a private psychiatric practice caring for patients across the lifespan and specializing in perinatal, perinatal mental health and ADHD. She is a mother of six and a grandmother of five. She enjoys reading, singing, traveling, and spending time with her family and passionately believes in lifelong learning. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Olson and Dr. Tanner as they present evidence-based pharmacological treatment of perinatal mental health disorders. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We're glad you're able to join with us and discuss this really important topic. First, we have our disclosure slides. So if you need any information, here's also the link to the evaluation for when we get done. In addition, here are our objectives and what we hope to accomplish as we meet together here today. So let's start out by talking about what are peripartum psychiatric conditions. And when we start talking about peripartum psychiatric conditions, there's a little bit of differences of way that we look at things, depending on if you're looking at it from a psychiatric view or sometimes from a midwifery view. So perinatal mental illness really is any disorder that's prevalent during pregnancy and can happen almost up to one year after delivery. However, some of the diagnostics specifically say up to one month after delivery. And so you'll see these terms used in different ways by different types of providers. Um, so most investigators who do this use a time frame ranging anywhere from four weeks to three months after delivery. So it's just important to remember that there is some, some people actually also talk about after breastfeeding. So 
important to consider that. So some of the common peripartum mood disorders are things like depression, anxiety, mania, hypomania, psychosis. And these are all things that can happen before pregnancy. They can emerge during pregnancy. They can recur during pregnancy or they can emerge during the postpartum period or recur during the postpartum period. So it's not just first time disorders that show up um, during this perinatal period. It can be a recurrence of a disorder that someone has had previously. So as you all know, when we talk about um, any kind of psychiatric condition, there are a lot of psychosocial considerations. And those include things like, was this a planned pregnancy? Is there any abuse going on? Socioeconomic status, um, things like social support, people's use of social media. What do they know about pregnancy based on that? Also things that they hear in the news, which as we know, can sometimes be really challenging to deal with and family advice. So all of this kind of comes into play when we talk about the different um, ways that we can treat perinatal mental illness and the different opinions of people about how that should be treated. And one of the biggest things I think is learning how do we trust the unknown? How do we trust the data that we have that may not be the most robust and lack of promises about how that data, um, what it tells us when everyone's so used to just getting on to Google and finding their answers. And if they get onto Google, they're going to find a bunch of different answers that can sometimes be difficult um, to kind of interpret. So I think that's just something that we really need to keep in mind. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is that there are always external factors that are impacting what's happening. So this is an example of that with COVID-19 in May of 2020, there was a study done. It was a pretty internet study, had a pretty good um, graphically racially diverse group of people. They were well-educated, most were multithyrists and they were early in pregnancy. But you can see here that 43% of them had probable anxiety, depression, or both. And of the ones that had probable depression, which was 36% of them, 53% of those women reported thoughts of self-harm and 42% had anxiety symptoms as well. So of the whole sample, 20% had thoughts of self-harm. So that's pretty significant when we look at the influence of these external factors on women's experience and um, the way that that we look at these different diagnoses. Uh, one thing that I was going to mention before we got started is you're going to hear us use the words women, parent, um, what we we're talking about anyone who's pregnant, any person who's pregnant. So it doesn't mean that we are excluding anyone. We're definitely um, talking about any pregnant person. And some of this data has been looked at on women. Um, and so it's more accurate to say women. And we don't really know, um, honestly, a lot about different um, situations where we have different people with different um, gender identities, that sort of thing, pregnant. We do know some about same-sex couples and how they react as well as adoptive moms and adoptive parents and fathers as well. But there are some definite research needs in that area for anyone who might be interested. So as we move forward, let's talk about why it's so important to treat perinatal mental illness. We know that if we don't treat it, we will have a lot of different effects that can come up for a lot of different groups of people. We know that for the mom, we can see poor judgment. We see poor self-care. These women who are not treated for their illness can have less prenatal visits. They don't eat as well, um, lack nutrition. They don't get the, just the prenatal care. They don't, they're not invested in the same way that someone who does not have one of these diagnoses is for the simple fact that they don't feel well enough to do that a lot of the time. You also see an increased risk of self-harm and that could look like cutting, it could look like other types of, of non-suicidal self-injury. It could also look like suicide attempts. And so we do see impulsive acts of suicide as well. And these, um, if you're not treated, you're more likely to be hospitalized in pregnancy as well. The other things that we see, we see a big effect on relationships and these relationships, the way that the couple interacts and the support that that engenders in the partner to support the pregnant person is really um, 
interesting and difficult because you can imagine if someone's depressed, it influences the quality of their relationship, which then influences the amount of support that they get back um, from their support system. So there can be a lot of arguing, fighting. It can lead to domestic violence. There can be isolation, um, just family dysfunction in general. And when we start talking about managing rules after delivery, you can see a problem with caring for the infant. The fetus itself can have a four times higher risk of intrauterine growth restriction, uh, two times higher risk of low birth weight, just if you have a psychiatric diagnosis. Um, Preterm birth, there's a 35% risk. That's almost one and a half times um, women who don't have a psychiatric diagnosis. And we see a lot of exposures to other substances as well. So for example, women who have anxiety in pregnancy, especially if they're worried about having a handicapped child or fears of what their pregnancy is going to do um, to their physical appearance, it's the strongest predictor of alcohol consumption during the antenatal period. So we need to remember that these, these effects still they happen and we need to be aware of them. Of course, after the birth, we see things like breastfeeding for shorter periods of time or not at all. We can see developmental delays due to bonding and interacting between the parent and the newborn or the infant. Um, also, we see just sometimes they lack medical treatment. They don't get routine follow-up visits, that kind of thing. And they can have some increased cognitive and behavioral issues as well. And always we have to consider the healthcare system as a whole, which also experiences then issues with cost because all of this has a cost that's associated with it. So let's talk about our treatment approach. There we go. There's different ways that we approach the treatment of these um, perinatal dis mental illnesses. You might hear these called PMADs, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. I really hate that term because who wants to be mad, especially if you're struggling, right? And especially if you're having depression or anxiety, I, I think that there's a better term. So I, I think we need to be a little careful with that term just as an aside. But when we think of approaching some of these conditions and how we wanna treat them, it's so important to have access to an interdisciplinary approach. We cannot handle it alone as a OB provider. And really, first line, yes, but we need to know what to look for because there are other things that can be associated with what looks like a simple depressed pregnant person. And guess what? We don't know. So we need to be aware of that. We also need to know how we can get help and how we can refer to people like therapists, who is in your area, how many therapists are there, what insurances do they take? If none, or if not many, then where's the next closest one? And do they do telehealth? And looking at obstetricians, what kind of support do we have for our consultants? Do, are they supportive of treatment? Do they understand the research and the evidence about what's okay and not okay? And then of course, we need a psychiatrist, or a psychiatric nurse practitioner, some sort of a psychiatric provider, so that when we do see something that we're not sure about or that concerns us, we have someone to refer to. And of course, all of this system surrounds the pregnant woman or pregnant person in the middle, because we all need to be working together as a team to surround this person with the support that they need. Another thing that's very important is shared decision-making. And in midwifery, we talk about this all the time, right? Shared decision-making. So there's, I, I found it interesting as I looked at shared decision-making, there are papers that talk about how do we make decision-making in, preg in pregnancy? And there's OB things about it and there's nursing things and there's psychiatry things. So of these concepts associated with shared decision-making, it's kind of interesting that, that they don't all discuss the same concepts and the same things. And so we need to really be alert and aware of what kind of shared decision-making we're going to use. What are we going to focus on? With the focus on what does this person need to know and what kind of decision-making? How do they feel about risk? How, do they need all the information we want to give them? And then how can we come to an agreement that we all understand is, is best for them and their situation? 
So it's important, preconceptual counseling is especially important. We need to know that if a woman of childbearing age is taking a psychiatric medication, we need to know what it is. We need to know, is it safe or not if she were to get pregnant? And we need to share that information every time because that's a decision that needs to be made um, in advance so that we can make sure that we do our part to make her as successful as she could be throughout that pregnancy. So when we talk about shared decision-making, one of the things that we need to consider is risk. So when we talk about risk, people really see risk so differently. And it's always been fascinating to me how that happens because we tend to talk about risk in ways that are really confusing. And even I look at risk and I look at odds ratios and relative risk and absolute risk and all of that. It's really difficult to kind of put it all into a, a, a way a format that we can kind of compare and make sense of it so that we can explain it to people. Imagine people trying to understand it. If they have a one in three risk versus a one in 10 risk, well, people are gonna think the one in three risk is so much better when really it's not. So it's when we talk about risk, we're really talking about the probability that something will happen. So what's the probability that you'll have an outcome from a medication that is negative? And we need to weigh the risk and the benefit of having these treatment versus no treatment or one treatment versus another treatment. And when we do that, it's important that we always talk about the risk of not treating as a woman with a psychiatric disorder. So we can't take a population of healthy pregnant people and compare them to a population of people who take psychiatric medication because it's not apples to apples. And so when we talk about risk, we need to be careful that the data we're using is accurate. And Dr. Olson will talk a little bit about um, some of the data that we have, and you'll see that that sometimes can be an issue. So when women are pregnant, we cannot do ethical randomized controlled trials. So the data we have is observational. Some of it is of large databases. Europe is wonderful for that because they have large databases. And some of it is, um, you know, based on a certain geographic or a certain demographic from a certain insurance, let's say, or something like that. So when we talk about risk, we need to be sure we do it in a way that's meaningful. So I explain things like, I never say your risk is 35 times higher if you have a baby when you're 40 than if you're 25. What does that mean, 35 times higher if I'm 40? I don't know what that means. But if I say, you know, if I put 140 year old women in a room all together, one of those people is going to have a fetus with Down syndrome, but the other 99 won't. And so when we talk about risk for medications and psychiatric conditions, we need to keep in mind that we need to make this in a format that people can understand. If you look at this, these are the risks per thousand women for some common things that we think of. So interestingly, the ones in red are the ones that we're most concerned about in a lot of ways. So you've probably heard lithium is horrible in pregnancy. Can't give it to people. Well, what's the risk of having um, Epstein's anomaly, cardiac anomalies on lithium? Well, it's less than one per 1,000. What's your risk of having a C-section for your first baby? 320 out of 1,000. And so we need to really put things in context. If we talk about neonatal abstinence syndrome or poor neonatal adaptation, which is something people worry about with SSRIs and SNRIs a lot, um, really that risk, if you look at it, 50 to 850 of a thousand. So it depends on how you define it and people define it differently. Most of these cases are very minor, don't even cause a problem and they just resolve. However, some do end up getting NICU admissions. And so if you're on antidepressants and have a NICU admission, then we're going to guess that a lot of those are probably related to poor neonatal adaptation. And so there's 178 out of 1,000, if, if um, sorry, that's wrong, 140 out of 1,000 that will be admitted to the NICU if they're on antidepressants. If you're not on antidepressants, but you have a psychiatric diagnosis, you still have an 80 out of 1,000 are gonna be admitted to NICU. So really there's 60 more out of a thousand. That means 940 are not, you know, that's the difference. So it's important if we look at it that way because we can give better advice and different advice to people based on our knowledge of that. So when we talk about treating like pre-pregnancy, 
we want to make sure that people are stable, that their mental health and their mental wellness is, um, is where it should be <laughs> before we even get started. So we want to make sure we do adequate preconceptual counseling. We want to make any medications early, the changes so that they're well. We want to make sure that they are safety, that they're stable on safe medications before they get pregnant. And then we want to plan our care for what are we doing during pregnancy? What are we doing after pregnancy? Who's responsible for what? We want to talk to the pediatricians and make sure that they know the plan and they're on board. So some important concepts to consider are that we can treat things pharmacologically with medications and non-pharmacologically. And it's we need to really pay attention to the non-pharmacologic reasons because there are a lot of women who just aren't comfortable with taking meds in pregnancy. And so we need to make sure that we have availability of that non-pharmacologic piece available to people. And essentially, when we start talking about what we need to do in pregnancy, we follow the golden rule, which is if you have a stable mom, you have a healthy pregnancy, you have a healthy baby. And so when a wo woman is stable on her medications, then we're going to leave her on those medications in almost every case to ensure that she stays stable throughout pregnancy. When we talk about the postpartum period, we know that we always talk about baby blues, 75% of people have baby blues, right? And that should be gone by about 10 days postpartum, two weeks postpartum. So we, if we see it getting worse instead of better, then that's a clue. And we all know kind of what it looks like, irritable, teary, crying in Hallmark commercials, that kind of thing. Uh, we get a lot, of, a lot of support, go to sleep, take care of yourself. And that tends to be all we need to do. When we look at postpartum depression, however, we need to look at some of the other risk factors. And that includes a lot of the socioeconomic risk factors, low socioeconomic status, lack of money, childcare stress. We need to look for complications that happen during pregnancy, as well as a history of either family or individual history of postpartum depression or other depression. So of course, as, especially as, as midwives and nurse practitioners, we really want to prevent things. So we really would love to prevent postpartum depression. And really there are, there's one way that kind of has been shown to be helpful and it does have a moderate net benefit according to the US Preventative Services Task Force for um, helping to prevent postpartum depression. And that is counseling. And so if people have a history of any of these factors and we provide counseling, some of the programs, you can find them online even, look a lot like Centering Pregnancy and Centering Parenthood, but they um, are group formats and individual formats that do psychoeducation, stress management, those kinds of things. And that can make a big difference. And anything we do helps because postpartum psychiatric admissions in the hospital has a greater mortality risk for women than almost any other single causes, including heavy smoking. So it's pretty significant essentially everyone, right, qualifies for one of these factors that tells us they should have um, the opportunity to be involved with one of those programs. So when we talk about screening for peripartum depression, everyone should be screened, all pregnant women, if you have access to some kind of therapy, kind of like if you don't know how to read a fetal monitor, don't put it on. Well, same concept. If you don't have access to treat something, then why screen? So we want to um, screen people definitely in the perinatal or in the prenatal period, usually around 28 weeks. Sometimes at the first prenatal visit as well, and we want to also check on them postpartum. So that could be at their comprehensive postpartum visit and at their well baby visits. And most pediatricians definitely do screen for this as well. And we need to use a validated instrument. So a lot of us use the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale, and as you know, a 10 and above is positive. But we know if you go for 13 as a cutoff, you're going to identify people that have a higher level of depression. And if you use an 11, you're gonna get less, um, but you're going to have a wider net. So you're going to get more people and they're not gonna fall through the cracks. So there's always a balance between how we screen. And when we talk about diagnosis, what we're looking at really is the same criteria as major depressive disorder. It occurs during pregnancy or the first uh, four weeks after birth, same criteria. 
So you have to have certain things happening. You have to have unhappiness, anhedonia. You have to be depressed, fatigue. So you have to look for these specific things. It's not just, I feel sad. And for women who've had postpartum depression before, if they maintain treatment, they have a about a quarter, one in four chance that they're gonna have a relapse. If they stop their antidepressant medication, there's about a 70% chance that they're gonna have a relapse. And most of the relapse will occur within the first two and a half months of pregnancy. So most people who stop their medicine, restart their medicine, which is important for us to, to share with people when they're thinking about, should I continue or should I not? Peripartum anxiety is very important because we don't pick up on it that much. It's hard to tell. Is someone just worried or are they really pathologically anxious? And this um, actually may be more prevalent than depression. And we, people who have anxiety pre-pregnancy or during pregnancy are more likely to have postpartum anxiety or depression. So in order to diagnose this, we have to be sure that we have the criteria, and you can look all these up online, of um, anxiety. These people, edgy, they're edgy, they're restless, they're concerned. They have these um, just fears, fears about lots of things. And we need to make sure that we're screening for that. We need to make sure that we're offering treatment, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment, and that we're really talking to our patients to ask them about these you know, what are they seeing? What are they having? These women who have uh, postpartum or peripartum anxiety feel panicked. They're overwhelmed because they're afraid. They feel out of control. Their fears are taking over their life. They pop into their head all the time. They're irrational. They know it's irrational most of the time. A lot of them do. And they're like, I don't know why I'm worried about this. Sometimes they're worried about the baby falling off their, you know, falling out of their arms down the stairs so they don't walk down the stairs or they hold the baby on the inside wall all the time. But this can be all consuming, like day and night, not sleeping, worrying, can't calm down, always feeling like they're in danger. And so it's really important that we look at that. Postpartum, interestingly enough, anxiety tends to focus on sexual fear or avoiding sexual interactions. And they have distress about it, but not dysfunction. So they worry, but it still works. And they have more body image issues um, than the majority of women without anxiety. So those are things to remember to look at. As far as bipolar illness, we know that women who have bipolar disorder prior to pregnancy have a higher risk for depression. And they, if they have thyroid disease, bulimia, PTSD, those are also associated with bipolar illness. And amazingly, one study found that more than half of people who were referred to postpartum depression clinics frequently had symptoms of hypomania or mania. So we need to be using a screening questionnaire like the mood disorder questionnaire, it's available online. And we need to never start an antidepressant without screening for the possibility of bipolar illness because if we do, it can throw someone into a manic episode, which can be very dangerous. And so when we look at who do we need to worry about, we need to worry about people who have a history, who are young, who have a new episode of depression after they deliver, who have psychotic symptoms. So these are things that you can be kind of heads up about and remember to keep that in the back of your mind. And when we talk about bipolar illness and mania and hypomania, it's really important to kind of understand what those are. So women who are manic have this abnormally elevated everything. So it can be like expansive mood. They feel like they can do anything. Very elevated, high, happy. Um, they can have a lot of goal-directed behavior. So some people will write lists all the time and they'll just feel really productive and have all these plans that they're going to do. And then they can't do them. And then all of a sudden they crash into a depression. Also, they it needs to be persistent. So, you know, having a great day is not a manic episode. It needs to last at least four days to be hypomanic and a week to be a manic episode. And it needs to be persistent every day, almost all day or bad enough, meaning you're behaving in dangerous ways or you've lost touch with reality to the point that you're psychotic and you're hospitalized. And that is a manic episode. So. If you're having a change in functioning, someone comes in and you just think this is not like her and you see a change in functioning, very distractible, just not acting like themselves, talking a lot, talking like 
I'm probably talking now, um, pressured speech, rapid speech, um, someone who's usually shy talking a bunch, any of that sort of thing really needs to be something that you focus on um, and make sure that you get them a good evaluation for bipolar illness. And don't just start them on an antidepressant if they say they're sad, because that can actually cause this to be much worse. So one thing that we all worry about, of course, is postpartum psychosis. And luckily, this is rare. It's one to two per 1,000 deliveries. When it happens, it's usually the first acute psychotic episode. And so they usually don't have a long psychiatric history. It just happens. And it can be associated with a past diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So that's something we need to watch for. Now, what is psychosis? When we talk about psychosis in the perinatal period, we're talking about an abrupt onset of behavior that is definitely not normal. This is when the woman's partner calls you and says, there is something wrong with my wife. Okay. That's psychosis. However, you don't always see it. And so sometimes it's internal. So people can have delusional thoughts and be really disorganized in their thinking in most cases. And if you don't ask, they may not tell you and you may think everything is fine. So it's important to ask, you know, are you seeing something that other people aren't? And I usually qualify that. And I say, I'm not talking little green men. I'm talking anything that, you know, maybe a lot of shadows or you think people are around you a lot and they're not, or I've had patients who've seen germs on the wall and, you know, they're washing their hands a lot and they say, yeah, I'm washing my hands a lot. I just want to stay clean for the baby. But when asked, they'll say, yeah, I see germs all over the wall behind you. That's delusional. And that is when they need to be hospitalized. Hallucinations, mania, mood swings, lots of mood swings, um, rambling speech. Uh, I've had people who were psychotic, who were out walking the street with their baby after they got out of the shower with a towel around them. And then they thought, oh no, the baby's gonna get cold. So they took their towel off and wrapped the baby to keep the baby warm. And they walked around the neighborhood naked. They got the police called and ended up in the hospital because that's delusional and very dangerous. So when this happens, these people need a higher level of care and it's likely that they will need to be hospitalized. So these are the cases that you send people to the emergency room always to be safe instead of not safe. The biggest worry, of course, that we all have is infanticide. That happens about two per 100,000 newborns. It's very low. We all know what happens when it happens in terms of not only the toll it takes on that individual family and person and partner, but also society. It makes the news. These people are likely to get in jail or, or mental institutions permanently. Um, and the risk factors for this are young, lower, less educated people who are single, and who don't have adequate prenatal care, and it's usually associated with psychosis. And so they believe a lot of the time it's religious beliefs, like, you know, God wants the baby back, or this, this earth is dangerous, the devil wants the baby. So that's a, just kind of a review of all the different, um, different diagnoses, different conditions we're talking about. And now Dr. Olson's going to talk to us about pharmacologic management and what you can expect to see. So I'm going to focus quite a bit on antidepressants, first of all, because I think um, what you're primarily going to see and what we do see in practice is a lot of antidepressants that are prescribed um, for patients that are um, during pregnancy. And we use antidepressants for a lot of things, even a lot of things beyond major depression. So we see major depression, um, or sorry, uh, antidepressants used to um, treat not only major depression, but um, their first line treatment for um, anxiety disorders, such as uh, generalized anxiety, panic disorder, uh, social anxiety. Um, they're also first line treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder. So um, they're used to treat a lot of different things and anxiety disorders and major depression are some of the biggest um, mental illnesses um, that exist. And so um, we're gonna see a lot of these types of medications prescribed. And so we see a lot of these medications prescribed during pregnancy. So when we're looking in the literature to see, you know, what, what medications are studied um, for efficacy, for um, safety, for um, 
outcomes in practice related to pregnancy, these are the different classes of medications that we see the most in the literature, SSRIs, tricyclics, SNRIs, and then kind of this atypical other category here. And these are the specific individual medications that you see most in the literature right now. The SSRIs are the most studied uh, medications for pre related to pregnancy. The TCAs are the tricyclics. Just a, there's a lot of literature on the TCAs and tricyclics, but mostly because they've just been around for a really long time. The tricyclics, the tricyclics are just a really old class of, of medications. Um, SNRIs and, and the other two columns, the, the atypical ones, the bupropion and mirtazapine, they just haven't been around and we just don't have as, as strong a data. We don't have as, as many numbers of studies, number of patients, participants um, to look at as we do in the, uh, in the other two classes of drugs um, when we're looking at the literature. I wanted to comment on Zoranolone because this is... Um, one of the new um, antidepressants that was just approved in 2023. You've probably heard of Brexanolone, which was the IV um, antidepressant for treatment of depression in the postpartum period. Um, but it was the IV formulation and um, very expensive, required patients to be on an IV treatment for 60 hours at a time, Brexanolone. So this is Zoranolone. This is it. This is a uh, oral formulation of the same type of medication. The reason why this is unique to um, postpartum is because um, this it actually imitates a synthetic analog of the naturally occurring hormone allopregnolone. So it really is very effective for this particular hormone because this is the hormone that drops off immediately after delivery. And it's believed that because that happens, that women are maybe more susceptible then to having mood symptoms right after pregnancy. And so by giving this hormone, um, then um, mood symptoms aren't, um, um, aren't developing quite as quickly. Um, patients that are more susceptible to depression um, aren't developing those symptoms and they can recover and recoup from depression very quickly. Um, they see patients recovering from depression within that first two weeks after the medication is given. The effects last for a couple of weeks um, after the medication is given. It doesn't let, it's a very fast acting medication, doesn't, but the effects also don't last very long. And, and we hear a lot about this, this kind of stuff like with ketamine, you know, and other, other types of medications like this. Um, this is the same type of concept where it works very quickly, pulls people out of depressions really quickly, doesn't last very long. Um, so very effective to pull people out of a severe depression. But then after that um, short period of time, the 45, 15 to 45 days, then people, uh, patients will need to resume some other form of treatment if they are continuing to have um, or need some form of treatment for their depression, whether that's psychotherapy or some other um, types of treatment for um, their depression, like some other antidepressants. Uh, but very exciting that we have um, this treatment and uh, treatment option, and also exciting that it also that it has a different different mechanism of action than some of the other antidepressants that we have on the market right now. All right, so now we're going to get into a little bit about the safety data related to the antidepressants. Um, and, and overall, despite antidepressants being one of the most studied classes of medications used during pregnancy, their use during pregnancy remains controversial. And that kind of goes back to what um, uh, Dr. Tanner was talking about with looking in the literature and looking at relative risk, absolute risk, and also depending on um, if the studies are looking and comparing apples to apples, because sometimes the controls that, that studies will use will be healthy people. And, and that really will throw off the statistics um, of a study if the study is looking at, okay, the, the patients that are taking the antidepressants are the people that have depression, but the people in the control group aren't necessarily people that have depression. And that in, in looking at those types of studies aren't really, aren't really giving us clear statistical information. So, so, so you really have to look at your studies and see what, what the controls are, what the confounding factors and variables are that the studies are using, especially if you find a study that says something completely different than what the norm has been. So if, if studies are saying, you know, generally out in practice, if we're saying that um, SSRIs, say, for example, are 
are generally safe in practice. And you've come across a study, a, a new meta-analysis that comes out that says, no, this we found this is different. We, we found that SSRIs actually aren't safe. They cause more congenital uh, malformations than we expected. I would really take a deep dive into that um, study and really see where they're getting their information from, what kind of studies, you know, what kind of controls. I, I would really look deeply into that um, just to make sure um, that they were really, you know, looking at and comparing apples to apples, that kind of thing, because there's a lot of studies out there that are looking at a lot of different variables. So be really careful when you're when you're looking at your literature and make sure that you you know what the study is looking at. So when when we're looking at the research and, and outcomes um, for um, uh, medications, a lot of the research is going to look at these types of outcomes cardiac malformations, congenital malformations, preterm uh, birth, persistent pulmonary hypertension, neonatal adaptation syndrome, and then any kind of long-term behavioral or neurocognitive types of outcomes. Um, a lot of times are what you're going to see measured um, in the literature. So the most commonly used antidepressants are going to be your SSRIs or SNRIs, and um, most, most of these types of antidepressants um, antidepressants are considered safe, and that also includes the tricyclic antidepressants, even those older antidepressants. Um, bear in mind that paroxetine does have an FDA warning um, that includes its that includes its use in first trimester in the first trimester related to an increased risk of cardiac malformation. So a lot of times, paroxetine is avoided if possible um, for use in pregnancy because of this increased use. It's not a huge um, um, increased uh, um, risk compared to the other SSRIs, but it is a, a, an increased risk compared to the other SSRIs in, in relation to the other SSRIs. Um, so originally when this black box warning came about, it was, the, it was because of the, um, the research that was done when the medication first came out from the drug company, the risk was there. So the FDA um, um, had them put the warning um, on it and studies have been repeated, you know, using Paxil, large pools of patients that have been on Paxil, large pools of, of patients that have been, you know, pregnant and been on Paxil. have looked at this over and repeated this over and over and over again. It's been and been conflicting. There's been some um, pools of studies that have not been able to repeat that um, that have found a large increased risk of the cardi cardiac malformation that was originally found in the original study. But there have been other studies that have still found a slightly increased risk compared to the other SSRIs overall. So, so that's where this next bullet point says that there's been conflicting data. Um, but overall, um, we can say that there is an increased risk um, compared to the other SSRIs overall with, with paroxetine. So, um, um, and then, like I said, there are, there is, there hasn't been shown any associations between the TCA use in pregnancy and structural malformation. So generally we say that the TCAs are safe for uh, practice as well, um, in use in pregnancy. All the SSRIs do cross the placenta. Most studies don't, uh, didn't find any increased, uh, total rate of malformations associated with the SSRIs as a group. So there's usually no absolute risk that is suggested. Sertraline is generally suggested in the studies um, to be the safest. And of course, paroxetine, uh, most reported drug associated with fetal heart malformations and generally in most studies is suggested to be uh, most, uh, mo the most uh, uh, at risk uh, for during pregnancy. So the SSRI, SSRI teratogenesis may be affected by various study methods. Again, this is where you need, really need to look at your studies, look at the weakness, the control groups, um, whether or not your studies are all looking at depression, untreated depression, you know, what are the confounding um, basis for, for all the things that, that the studies are looking at. Make sure that you're looking at that very closely in your studies. Um, looking at venlafaxine, bupropion, duloxetine, and mirtazapine, this is kind of looking at the SSRIs and, and then the other um, category, there's no statistically significant differences necessarily that have been found in the studies that have been done on these drugs or are higher than expected rates of congenital anomalies when compared to controls. So um, specifically, I know there's other SNRIs um, that are um, in practice, but really most of the literature is, has looked at venlafaxine and duloxetine. That's where we have most the most literature. Um, and, and generally, these two drugs have been um, considered relatively safe as far as major malformations are concerned. 
Um, now, there generally is not as much data as there is for the SSRIs and TCAs on these particular uh, four medications. Rate of preterm delivery was significantly increased for the SNRIs uh, compared to the SSRIs. Um, rate of neonatal symptoms was similar to the SSRIs as far as these drugs compared to the SSRIs. Um, there wasn't um, any increased risk of congenital malformations. The risk of persistent pulmonary hypertension is low. Um, so there wasn't any increased risk of that with these particular medications. Um, when you're thinking about starting an antidepressant for someone um, that is um, that is pregnant, always the general rule of thumb is um, um, starting antidepressant at the lowest dose, titrating it slowly till the person has relief of their symptoms. If a medication has worked well for them in the past um, and they've had a positive response, um, looking to that medication to restart that. Um, less is always better. I always tell my patients this, especially even the reverse. If someone comes to you and they're on multiple medications and they either might want to become pregnant or are pregnant, I always tell them that it's better to decrease the number of medications that a person is on. It decreases the amount of risk and exposure um, that the person has. And so I always try to decrease the number of medications that my patients are taking, if at all possible, whether I'm starting or whether they come to me and they're on several medications. Thinking about metabolism with medications, so when patients get towards that third trimester and their volume increases, um, sometimes this can influence serum, serum levels of medications and thinking about um, talking with patients about that, um, making sure that they're, um, they have they're monitoring for their psychiatric symptoms and thinking about whether or not they need to make adjustments to any of their medications, whether they're taking antidepressants or any other psychiatric medications or, or other medications for that matter. Um, but they could have relapse of their symptoms um, if their um, serum uh, levels of their medications were to uh, become less. Not everybody necessarily needs adjustments, but for some patients, this, this definitely could be an issue. Neonatal adaptation difficulty. So there's a cluster of clinical symptoms seen in infants. Um, and, and mostly this is because of, so any um, patients that have been taking antidepressants, sometimes antipsychotics, um, benzodiazepines, here it also mentions opiates, um, the uh, infants and neonates can be at risk. Um, uh, at delivery of developing neonatal adaptation symptoms, which can include this jitteriness, excitability, respiratory distress types of symptoms, and sometimes have difficulty with irritability, sleep, and difficulty feeding um, at birth. Um, usually the symptoms are mild to transient um, when this happens. It lasts for a few days to maybe up to a week or so afterwards. It's a little more common with paroxetine and fluoxetine. It's usually not a life-threatening type of um, adaptation or syndrome, um, this, the neonatal adaptation syndrome that I'm talking about. Now, I'm not talking about withdrawal, the actual withdrawal from like a benzodiazepine or an opiate. That's a separate thing. Um, what I'm talking about here is just the neonatal adaptation type of thing. So just, just so you know that this that is a separate thing. There isn't a recommendation in the literature about stopping medications prior to delivery for this um, because there, there's some, it's kind of conflictual in, in the literature. Some say, yes, we should do this. That's kind of an old school of, way of thinking. And as I say, well, there really isn't any, um, any um, there really isn't any, anywhere where it says that this is necessary. 30% of newborns born to women who have been taking an SSRI during the third trimester will have infants that will um, have a poor neonatal adaptation will develop that. Um, and usually it resolves by two weeks of age. Persistent pulmonary um, hypertension of the newborn. So increased risk of persistent pulmonary hypertension usually occurs in about one to 2% of uh, infants of mothers that have been taking SSRIs. Non-SSRI antidepressants are not usually associated with persistent pulmonary hypertension that we know of at this point. Again, we don't have enough studies to really show this, but at this point, there hasn't been a large uh, percentage um, of studies that have shown that other um, SSRIs or other antidepressants um, um, will develop uh, this, this type of outcome. Although other mother, other outcomes from um, other outcomes can increase the risk, such as maternal depression, obesity, and smoking, surgical delivery um, risk factors can also put people at risk or infants at risk for persistent um, pulmonary hypertension. Long-term effects on the offspring, there's, again, limited data on this, but um, generally speaking, there, there's no adverse neurocognitive effects that have been found 
um, from some studies that I've looked at that looked at um, infants at six months and nine months after delivery from uh, infants that had uh, mothers that were taking SSRIs. Um, there was one study um, that of a mother that had depression and did not take an SSRI, but that went on to have a children, a study that looked at children um, of people that had depression, but didn't have treatment, but did have children um, and long-term outcomes of children that did have conduct and social problems. So not necessarily medication related, but actually illness related. And then uh, in another study comparing comparatively found no difference in mothers with depression that were treated and depression not treated with both SSRI and venlafaxine in any cognitive or behavioral outcome measures. So you can see there's there's a lot of conflict conflicting data in findings and inconclusive um, types of things. You find one study that said said that there wasn't any um, uh, long term outcome problems. Another study that there was. So we need to continue to look at this um, as far as whether or not there's long term effects affecting offspring with treatment with SSRIs and also with major depression in general. Um, TCAs in general were not found to be linked to behavior, cognitive function, or temperament in young children as far as long-term outcomes. Anti-anxiety treatment, safety data, monitoring. Of course, the SSRIs and SNRIs are first-line treatment for um, treatment of anxiety, and we talked about that in the previous slide. Benzodiazepines are also used to treat uh, generalized anxiety, panic attacks, things like that. Um, high dosing of benzodiazepines is never really a good idea during pregnancy. Um, can put patients at risk for, particularly in the first trimester, malformation, heart defects, and of course, later on in pregnancy, if, if patients are taking benzodiazepines on a regular basis, closest, closer to um, closer to delivery, they can, um, infants can have trouble with withdrawal um, and poor tone and things like that um, during, during delivery or after delivery. Um, so the recommendation is if, if patients are taking benzodiazepines on a regular basis, if they can discontinue that before delivery, that would be best for, um, for um, to be done before delivery, if at all possible. Um, I always recommend um, just short acting and only as needed or sparingly if benzodiazepines need to be, need to be used is, is usually what I recommend. Otherwise, um, infants can go on to develop this floppy, floppy infant syndrome, um, which can consist of hypothermia, lethargia, poor respiratory effort, feeding difficulties. And sometimes infants need to be treated with medications because they actually have some withdrawal, withdrawal symptoms if, if they're born um, um, to a mother that has been taking benzodiazepines on a more consistent basis. Um, and, and then sometimes um, the infants can have symptoms where they might need to be treated um, postpartum. Some other anxiety treatments, um, Buspirone, we just don't have a lot of data um, on, as to whether or not the safety data, as far as whether or not that's safe to use in pregnancy. Hydroxyzine, we have limited reproductive data, although it's used a lot. Um, but it doesn't seem to appear uh, is what the literature, what I found in the literature, uh, doesn't seem to be associated with congenital malformations. Um, and SGA, quetiapine or Seroquel, we see this used a lot for insomnia and for anxiety. It has low placental passage compared to all the other second generation antipsychotics. There is some risk of cardiac malformations and gestational diabetes and increased risk of miscarriage a little bit with the SGAs. Usually when it's used for anxiety, it's used in lower doses. Um, trazodone, there's limited safety data, and gabapentin, there's no significant findings for increased risk of congenital malformations, but um, usually not considered first-line treatment for anxiety in pregnancy. Mood stabilizers and antipsychotics, um, as you know, um, again, all these are getting into more specialized psychiatry medicines, but just a, kind of a review of what you might see patients on for treatment of bipolar if they're treated with mood stabilizers. This would be, consist of things like lamictal, Depakote or Tegretol, valproic acid, carbazepine. Lithium isn't, isn't considered a mood stabilizer, but it, it, lithium is kind of in a class all by itself, but it is used to treat bipolar illness. This just talks about the different phases, different types of um, bipolar illness that these medications are used to treat. So um, Dr. Tanner kind of talked about this with, you know, that really this type of illness, it really needs to be treated even during pregnancy, because there's just a higher risk of, of relapse, higher risk of, of mental health problems if this type of illness isn't treated, higher risk of major depression, suicide, 
um, alcohol, tobacco misuse, like it says here, and I think more, which leads to more pregnancy problems, poor nutrition, um, and lack of prenatal care, things like that. Lithium is very effective and has been studied a lot in the literature for treatment of bipolar. Um, it helps reduce the risk of suicide, but it has uh, the largest uh, shows. It's been shown to have the largest uh, show, shown to have the largest efficacy in the peripartum period. So, especially for treatment of bipolar. Um, historically, of course, this is the reason why it's been kind of sketchy. Like, do we use? Do we not use lithium in? in um, pregnancy because of this cardiotoxicity and Epstein's anomaly. Now, again, this was back in the 1970s when this original um, study was done that showed this, the, the, and it was really, the estimates and the statistics were really high. This has been repeated, the, the, the study um, has been repeated multiple times and really haven't ever been able to get the statistics as high as they once did. Um, with um, that study that was done in the 1970s. Again, because of the way the studies have been done, they've done, they've looked at confounding factors, made sure they're comparing apples to apples, you know, looking at patients that have bipolar, making sure the controls also have patients that have bipolar, you know, looking, looking at all of those characteristics so that this, so that the statistics aren't and the risk factors aren't um, skewed and really have found that, that it, it's really not, there is still a risk with using lithium, especially in the first trimester, if, you, if patients are using lithium, there is gonna be an increased risk, but the risk isn't as great as it once was thought. Um, so the rule of thumb is generally, if a patient can be stable on lithium and can keep their bipolar stable, that they really should continue on lithium um, during their pregnancy. Of course, it does it require some close monitoring, especially when it gets to close to that end of that third trimester. Um, to make sure that their lab levels are okay and that their symptoms are remaining stable. And, and for the infant, there should be some cardiac monitoring with a fetal echo and ultrasounds. Um, also during uh, the postpartum period, infant may have uh, be at risk for some floppy baby syndrome. So they may require some more close monitoring and also uh, may need to have some lithium levels checked and some thyroid levels checked and things like that. Um, in that postpartum period as well. Also, mother and may require some um, some checking postpartum as well because they they may need to go back to their um, pre uh, pre pregnancy um, lithium levels, but they might want their lithium levels to be a little bit more on the higher end um, postpartum because there could be a high risk for for developing depression during that postpartum period of time. Um, I know we're running a little bit. Um, um, tight on time. So I'm just going to just kind of run through the slides and kind of give you a little bit of information about what's here. And this is probably a review of what I've just talked about with the lithium and things like that. But with the mood stabilizers, I can basically tell you Depakote is a big no-no um, during pregnancy. There's just a very high risk of teratogenic um, um, risks with um, Depakote um, and pregnancy. Um, if, if you can not put a woman of childbearing age on Depakote, um, that's, that's best or making sure that you have a very good pregnancy plan for anyone that potentially might become pregnant and they need to be treated with Depakote um, or having that communication with whoever their psychiatrist um, is, you know, kind of um, just make, having a good communication plan about, about that um, because there's just, it's just very, very high risk. Tiger towel is probably the next highest risk if a person has to be stabilized with that for some sort of reason, but lamictal and lithium generally are pretty safe um, for treatment of bipolar when we're looking at the mood stabilizers. Looking at antipsychotics quick, which are used a lot for treatment of bipolar and schizophrenia. Generally, these um, second generation antipsychotics are generally pretty safe. Some have been studied more than others. Um, and have um, you know a better profiles than others as far as the congenital um, um, malformations and even the cardiac malformations. Haldol generally is considered pretty safe and safer generally than like these other two, the Thorazine and the Prolixin, um, as far as um, use during pregnancy. Risperdal here um, for the second generation antipsychotics is probably out of all of the second generation antipsychotics is the only one that probably is the considered the highest risk for congenital um, malformations. And I'll show you a study here in just a second. Quetiapine, like I mentioned earlier, is considered uh, safe, safer compared to a lot of the other second generation antipsychotics, mostly because of its low um, placenta levels. It doesn't pass through the um, placenta as much as a lot of the other um, antipsychotics do. For some reason, there's this school of thought that Latuda is safe. 
And a lot of a lot of providers are like, oh, just put them on Latuda because they're if they're pregnant. But honestly, we don't have any data that says that Latuda is safe during pregnancy. There's actually no, we only have animal data. There's really very, very little human data to say that Latuda is safe in pregnancy. I'm, so I'm not really sure where that information comes from. Um, so we, we need to get some more evidence um, to say that Latuda is safe in pregnancy. I'm, I'm sure it will be since a lot of the other second generation antipsychotics are, but um, we really don't have a strong base of data to support and say that Latuda is definitely safe in, in practice um, uh, for use in pregnancy. But like I said, Risperdal does tend to be a little bit higher with some congenital malformations. This is a comparison of the first and second generation antipsychotics. And again, some of the older uh, this there's actually an error here on this second bullet point. This should say small increase seen with low potency agents such as um, Thorazine. The Thorazine is actually a low potency um, antipsychotic, and there's a no increased risk of malformation seen with high potency agents, and that would be medications like Haldol. And then, of course, with any um, of the older antipsychotics, we're watching patients for the EPS and withdrawal types of side effects. This is the the study that I was talking about that points out that Risperdal has a little bit higher um, congenital uh, malformation risk than a lot of the other antipsychotics. 